Okay, we're back again with Act Two of A Midsummer Night's Dream. Um, just as a reminder, um, uh, there aren't a lot of PowerPoints or anything, uh, images. It's just kind of me talking and reading. So feel free to treat this as a podcast, put it in earbuds and exercise, take a bike ride, not on streets, on a path, <laughs> but uh, you're being safe. <clears throat> uh, and so uh, we have the fairies showing up. Uh, act uh, one had ended with this parallelism between um, the underplot uh, or the um, setting up at least of a play within a play um, and the promise to meet in the woods. And so here we are in the woods um, for act two. Uh, and we have a fairy and we have Robin Goodfellow uh, or also known as Puck. And Robin says, <clears throat> How now, spirit, whither wander you? And the fairy says, Over hill, over dale, throw bush, throw briar, um, uh, over park, over pale, throw flood, throw fire. I do wander everywhere, swifter than the moon's sphere, and I serve the fairy queen to do her orbs upon the green. The cowslips tall her pensioners be, in their gold coats spots you see, those bee rubies fairy favors, and those freckles live their savors. I must go seek some dewdrops here, and hang a pearl in every cowslip's ear. Farewell, thou lob of spirits, I'll be gone. Our queen and all her elves come here anon. And then Robin responds. <clears throat> the king doth keep his revels here tonight. Take heed the queen come not within his sight, for Oberon is passing fell on wrath, because that she, as her attendant, hath a lovely boy stolen from an Indian king. She never had so sweet a changeling. And jealous Oberon would have the child, knight of his train, to trace the forest's wild. But she perforce withholds the boy, crowns him with flowers, and makes him all her joy. And now they never meet in grove or green, by fountain clear and spangled starlit sheen. But, but they do square that all their elves, for fear, creep into acorn cups and hide them there. Okay, so um, there's some drama that's going on and the, a mention of this drama that's going on between Titania and Obi-Ron, who again are kind of a parallel or a doubling to uh, the um, Theseus and Hippolyta. And so what we want to sort of uh, mention, I think at the first blush here is <clears throat> at least for Shakespeare's time, um, I think fairies are a lot more serious business than they are in the 21st century. And I mentioned in an earlier lecture that it's in the 19th century that you get this kind of infantilization, this association of um, children with fairies. And this um, is part of a, a broader thing that I will call the European or Euro-Christian social imaginary that tended to associate children um, and women and uh, native peoples of the world um, as being somehow closer to nature and associated men um, with more rationality and more civilization um, as being far away from nature. These are kind of later developments that happen uh, throughout uh, European and English political and philosophical thought. And it's hard for us to sometimes, I think in the 21st century, um, jump back. Um, so uh, um, fairies um, uh, ha have a stronger um, sort of association. So I'll, I'll point this out with, uh, with Thomas Nash with his book, um, the terrors of the night in a couple of minutes here, but just a couple of things to, to before I quite get there. Um, 
uh, um, we see that um, the, the, we can hear, hopefully you can hear, um, that there's uh, um, a, a very much of a, a metrical rhythm happening. Um, there's a six, seven verse um, with alternate rhymes. Um, uh, so six syllables followed by seven syllables. And it, that kind of off meter, I think, of the seven, um, the odd meter anyway, keeps things pushing, right? So you can think of this a little bit um, like dancing or like in, in music, um, like a waltz is like one, two, three, one, two, three, one, two, three, one, two, kind of sways. And it has that kind of back and forth type of, of, of rhythm. Um, and the same thing if you count it in six, eight, like one, two, three, four, five, six, bum, 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 um, uh, uh, versus four, four, would like one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four. You can feel that if it's, it becomes more dancey, if I go one, two, three, four. And so the shifting from six to seven, uh, makes things kind of keep pushing. It doesn't quite, uh, uh resolve and it, and it, and it feels like it, like it pushes the, the lines, um, further on, um, <clears throat> Uh, um, we see that the fairy here says that, um, that, that he or she, or maybe some in between gender, um, uh, um, says that, um, it serves the fairy queen here. And so that there's a direct reference again to um, probably Spencer and Spencer's Fairy Queen and an invocation of Queen Elizabeth in the play as well, who would be then sort of associated with uh, Titania. But also we know that Titania, there's this Hippolyta thing going on too. So things aren't always one for one. They don't always square up in terms of symbolism or illusion, but uh, there might be something else at work. And that's what we do when we write papers on uh, this stuff where we track the imagery as we try and find logic that might be at work that we might not have seen before. Um, so that's just another sort of space of, of opening things up. Um, uh, um, Puck or Robin here um, also mentions um, changelings. Um, uh, uh, changelings, uh, at least all the way until the end of the 19th century in Ireland. And the idea of a changeling is that fairies come and they will steal people. Um, they will um, take them sometimes over the hills and far away. And there are lots of uh, um, references. And you'll hear that, like, e even when, like, over hill, over dale, right? Which we might hear in, like, um, like I think it's like an army song, right? Uh, the cantons keep rolling along. Um, uh, we see that kind of language all the way idiomatically back in Shakespeare. Um, uh, um, so a changeling, um, uh, the idea is that if, if uh, a ch sometimes it's a child, but it, it doesn't have to be a child, um, will um, be sort of taken away with fairies in the night. And if you eat in the fairy realm, you become part of the fairy realm itself. Um, uh, and you die, but they will sometimes swap somebody out with somebody who's a double who looks just like like them. Um, uh, so we have a case, there's a famous case from the late 1800s of an Irish man who actually kills his wife um, and says in court that it wasn't his wife that he killed, it was actually a double and that the, his actual wife had been taken over by fairies, right? So it's that I mean, that's a lot closer to us in time, but it's really hard, I think, for uh, people to conceptually get around how somebody could make a serious case like that um, and not just be entirely crazy. Um, and, and that's basically how he was being perceived. But the fact that he could do that speaks to a, a cultural situation. So now if we pat, like move that back in time, a few hundred years and you might start getting a conception of that the fairy situation is more serious in Shakespeare's time. The other thing that makes fairies serious is that they clearly allude to paganism. 
to pre-Christian times. And that invocation of paganism, when there's so much debate about the proper ways to uh, worship Christianity in Shakespeare's time, is going to have a layered and double meaning, if not more than double meaning. Um, I mentioned in an earlier lecture, the Indian boy, and that this is colonialism showing up uh, in the text. It's not a massive part of the text, but it might be something that's worth, again, worth digging into. What is the, is there any kind of larger relevance that you can see in this invocation of the Indian boy um, uh, who seems to be a favorite? Again, maybe perhaps allusions to sexual favorite with uh, um, the queen, but uh um, Oberon, he says, jealous Oberon would have the child knight of his train. So he wants to, um, to, to, um, enlist, um, this Indian child that's been stolen away. Uh, um, hmm. I don't want to say any more about Uh, no, I, I was maybe going to sing you a song, and I'm not going to do that right now. <laughs> a Scottish song. Uh, <clears throat> um, okay, so the fairy, um, again, marks Robin Goodfellow as one who um, uh, steals cream from the milk, um, disallowing butter to be churned, and stealing barm or yeast, um, preventing brewing. And so this is something that fairies did is they kind of they kind of disrupt things um, in country life. Uh, these were things that were associated with evil spirits and goblins and witchery. Hobgoblins were um, also known as b beneficent brownies. And um, you've probably seen these types of figures in, in some recent movies as well. Um, uh, in, in a way, hobbits are kind of brownie like being kind of smaller and being beneficent or helpful um especially the the um uh uh i can't remember their names right now um the couple of of um hobbits in the lord of the rings trilogy that are the kind of dynamic duo the comedy duo there I'm, if you've seen the films i'm sure that you know um, um i have so many token fans uh uh that they probably are yelling at, at the screen right now. So there's an exchange um, here between Oberon and Titania that again is reminiscent of Zeus and Hera, of Jupiter and Juno. And why do I say um, uh, Jupiter and Juno here? So um, uh, at the same time that um, Theseus is the mythical founder of Athens. He's also a son and a sort of a relationship to Zeus, the father of the gods, and his wife Hera. And there's always a kind of uh, battle going on between the two of them in terms of um, extramarital or amorous affairs. Juno, of course, is also the goddess of marriage um, and wants uh, uh, things to be stabilized. There was an invocation of Dido, for example. Um, uh, Hermia swears by Dido, who got screwed over by Aeneas um, uh, in Carthage and left. Uh, this is in Virgil's Aeneid. And, and he is cursed by Juno um, uh, uh, for not only that, but, but, but other, other reasons as well. And so Juno is a, a marriage goddess. Um, uh, and then, and, and his intention with this kind of founding of a new gener a certain new civilization for the Trojans. In um, t uh, Act 2, um, uh, um, 2.1, um, and uh, so scene once and line 64, Titania blames Oberon for his sexual infidelity and blessing Theseus and Hippolyta, but then Oberon turns around and blames her for loving Theseus and leading him into inconstancy. So there's this tit for tat lovers quarrel going on that embodies also infidelity and clear sexual relationships outside of the marriage as well. Um, uh, uh, Titania gives a speech on nature and its pagan and pastoral elements seem original here. It's possible, I think, to read this as Shakespeare showing his own rural folk knowledge 
against the classically educated peers in London. So remember in earlier lectures, uh, Shakespeare seems to have been made fun of for not being part of the London elite and for aspiring to be this stage director, this this play writer. Um, and uh, yet he didn't hadn't been to Oxford and wasn't educated in the same ways that some of his peers were. And so they they kind of made fun of him as being a country bumpkin. And this I think it's possible to read Shakespeare kind of like like exploiting his country bumpkinness for a way of also <clears throat> um, talking about England, invoking the fairy queen, which is Spencer's um, allusion in his uh, epic poem, The Fairy Queen, um, uh, and and using um, fairies and pagan folklore from pre-Christian times to um, locate himself in a deeper sense. Um, uh, with England as well, with the, with the land. <clears throat> so, uh, um, Titania gives a speech on nature. Um, a Midsummer Night's Dream doesn't appear to have sources other than Pyramus and Thisbe. And so this moment of originality or seeming originality. I mean, some a different scholar could come up with some text that Shakespeare was referring to here um, that might be earlier, but we don't have one right now that I know of. Um, he seems to instead by be um, sort of invoking um, general um, sensibilities that, that would be from pre-Christian times. Now, why is this important? Well, again, I want this is where I want to come back to Nash here. So Nash's book comes out um, around the time that Shakespeare is writing A Midsummer Night's Dream, and it's called Terrors of the Night. It's a book about dreams and where they're from. And this is really early on in his text. Thomas Nash, who may have been one of the people who were making fun of Shakespeare, says, In the time of infidelity, when spirits were so familiar with men that they called them um, deep um, penates, um, uh, uh, like kind of like household gods, um, their household gods or their lairs, um, uh, they never sacrificed unto them till sunsetting. Um, so sacrifices were happening at night, pagan sacrifices. Um, the Robin Goodfellows, elves, fairies, hobgoblins of our later latter age, which idolatrous former days and the fantastical world of Greece eclept fauns, satyrs, dryads, and homodryads did most of their merry pranks in the night. Then ground they malt and had hempen shirts for their labors, danced in rounds in the green meadows, pinched maids in their sleep that swept not their houses clean, and led poor travelers out of their way notoriously. Again, that's the changeling thing. He says, it is not to be gainsaid, but the devil can transform himself into an angel of light, appear in the day as well as in the night, but not in this subtle world of Christianity so usual as before. If he do, it is when men's minds are extraordinarily thrown down and put discontent and melancholy and they get depressed and all of that. So what I'm wanting to sort of show here is, first of all, like Robin Goodfellow or Puck, like these are not figures that Shakespeare just made up. They're part of folklore of his time period. And you have a writer like Thomas Nash, who's starting to impose this historical skew of before Christianity and after Christianity and what Christianity and Christian civilization has brought to things. That, when I talk about the Euro-Christian imaginary, that's what I'm talking about. Um, uh, um, it's, it's a social movement. It's not just a religion. And it imposes a kind of temporality of before and after onto the times. And so uh, the time of infidelity, right? The time when uh, uh, there could be all sorts of extramarital sexual affairs, for example, like that are going on in the play, is being invoked here as well. That's part of the comedy. It's part of also the carnivalesque nature of A Midsummer Night's Dream. Um, but it also shows that Shakespeare is quite capable of originality and invention. 
He doesn't do it all the time because that's not what classical authors that he's kind of mimicking do, but uh, he can come up with, with uh, his own inventions as well. Um, so the speech that Titania gives, and that might be a nice focus place for a paper, um, is um, uh, uh, it's a speech that seems to argue that jealousy disrupts the rhythms and the natural cycles of creation. I'm not going to read it out to you, but I'll, I'll, I'll just like give you some, some food for thought as you read um, Titania's speech. There's a dampness mentioned in the speech that the dampness could signal conditions of plague too. Um, so Titania defends having the child, the Indian child here, and refers to spiced India. That's why earlier on I said um, this is probably the India of the East rather than South America. Um, his uh, mother was impregnated by a sailor, according to Titania's um, uh, uh, account of this Indian child, um, and perhaps Neptune, um, who is a um, ocean god, right? Um, so uh, there's a dolphin speech that shows up in. Um, let me get my book here. <clears throat> um, as well in here, that's something that's worthy of 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 perhaps looking at in a little bit more detail and, and doing some research on. Um, uh, um, and and in uh, a place to look there is in Stephen Greenblatt's book um, in Will of the World. And um, uh, you can reach out to me specifically if you're thinking of doing paper stuff. Um, what Greenblatt argues at the, is that um, this is actually a direct reference with the dolphin thing which is just it's just kind of weird like it's in england and like this the, these references to the sea and dolphins and um uh it seems to be according to greenblatt shakespeare remembering this moment when he would have been a child when elizabeth came to visit his town and he's anticipating that elizabeth is in the audience and that elizabeth will remember when she visited that particular town. Um, so uh, uh, Oberon says, um, well, go thy way, thou shalt not, um, uh, he's saying, that, saying this to Puck, well, go thy way, thou shalt not from this grove till I torment thee um, for this injury. My gentle Puck, come hither. Uh, uh, so he's, sorry, he's he's just told Titania that he, um, he's um, gonna torment her. Um, he says, my gentle puck, come hither. Thou rememberest since once I sat upon a promontory uh, uh, and heard a mermaid on a do dolphin's back uttering such a dulcet and harmoni harmonious breath that rude sea, the rude sea um, grew civil at her song and certain stars shot madly from their spheres to hear the, seas, the sea maid's music. And Robin says... I remember, and Oberon says uh, that uh, that that very time I saw, but thou couldst not, flying between the cold moon and the earth, Cupid all armed, a certain aim he took at a fair vestal throned by the west, and loosed his love shaft smartly from his bow, as it should pierce a hundred thousand hearts, but I might see young Cupid's fiery shaft quenched in the chaste beams of the watery moon, and the imperial votaress passed on in maiden meditation fancy free. So what is all this, what is all, all happening? Well, if it's an invocation of Queen Elizabeth, the fairy queen, um, uh, not, uh, so uh, um, who missed it, the, the, he's talking about an arrow that missed its mark, right? But he's talk, he remembers this time. If it's an invocation of Elizabeth, the virgin queen who, um, who's being layered on top of Titania here, um, it's also possibly a reference to one of many assassination attempts that had happened earlier on in Queen Elizabeth's reign, um, where different suitors were trying to um, 
uh, find a way into a marriage alliance with Queen Elizabeth. And eventually she decides that she's just not going to marry anybody. Um, it means that she will still take lovers, um, but she won't marry anyone. She won't disrupt the the um, uh, the royal sort of bedroom, the family situation in England throughout her career. And this is something that she will become criticized for, especially late in her career, when people are unsettled about who the next heir is going to be, the next in line for um the crown once she passes uh, and we'll get to more of that when i think when we get to hamlet which is written closer to that period in time so all of that is just say like there's there's political context there's possible real situations of assassination there's um possible flattery going on with elizabeth and then there's also this rebuke that theseus is giving to um, Titania um, and and I could have gotten some like little details in that 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 diatribe wrong um, but again that's what research and what we figure out when we're doing um, uh, research papers and some sort of close closer analysis of the text that I'm able to do right now there is a scene in the film there's a film called Elizabeth that came out um, a few years ago that kind of stages something like this where um, an arrow is shot into a boat with Elizabeth and a French suitor um, and it misses the mark, right? Um, and so if we layered something like that on top of um, this reference to Cupid, right? Like uh, um, there's some double meaning perhaps going on. Uh, it's possibly also a place to, to um, uh, um, hint at um, some sort of Catholic tendency in Shakespeare there. Probably something that, that needs uh, more fleshing out in the paper. Um, uh, so in any way, we get a praise of nature going on in Titania's speech here. Um, uh, then we get the dolphin speech. Um, and then um, we get... Um, Demetrius and Helena coming in and Oberon is watching them, right? And he sees this uh, situation where Demetrius is rejecting Helena. Um, and she responds in these kind of sado, like masochistic terms. Sado isn't a word yet because it re refers to a later figure. But masochism, right, the enjoyment of pain. Um, and, and sexually, some people enjoy this sort of thing. Um, she says, use me, but as your spaniel, spurn me, strike me, neglect me, loose me. Um, very sexualized language um, uh, to be a woman and to be called loose and to say that you want to be made loose, to be used like a dog. Um, this might be funny in certain contexts as well, but it's also like directly sexual. Right, it's it is a, a it, this is not a G-rated moment at all. Um, uh, um, here, um, Helena in uh, two point one um, uh, lines twenty two twenty to two twenty six. Um, uh, she uses what is called a metaphysical conceit. Now, a conceit in poetry. So th these are terms. You know the. I want at least my students to be thinking about um, what is a conceit. Well, it's another word for conception. It comes from the same uh, word that we think for to conceive a thought, to have something internal that is invented. Um, and a, a metaphysical conceit takes that internal, sometimes exaggerated metaphor that seems kind of original and amplifies it to talk about all of kind of all creation or the nature of reality. Um, uh, I put in a definition in my notes here from uh, uh, Encyclopedia Britannica, maybe just to give some more precise language here. And so uh, Britannica says that a conceit is a figure of speech, usually a simile or a metaphor that forms an extremely ingenious or fanciful parallel between apparently dissimilar 
or incongruous objects and situations. There's a Petrarchan conceit. So this was part of poetry at the time and part of Renaissance poetry in particular, which um, so the Petrarchan conceit um, was especially popular in the Renaissance um, and sonnets. And so you see this going on in Shakespeare's sonnets as well. Um, it's a hyperbolic comparison, oftentimes between a suffering lover and his beautiful mistress to some physical object, like a tomb or the ocean or the sun. Um, Edmund Spencer's epithalamion, or sorry, epithalamion uh, uh, for instance, characterizes the beloved's eyes as being like sapphires shining bright, with her cheeks like apples with the sun hath root, um, which the sun hath rutted, and her lips like cherries charming men to bite. Um, uh, uh, so it might sound, I mean, like bad poetry to our ears, um, but it was part of the style of the time as, as can you take something that might seem like it's impossible to compare between one thing and make it make sense, right? Um, uh, so we can think of the conceit as a different kind of doubling um, than irony and um, satire, which I've mentioned in earlier lectures, um, but one that particularly relies on estrangement, um, uh, not to parody or produce satire, but to establish intimacy. So if satire tries to make fun of situations like, oh, these is the funny ways that people act, and parody is like, well, you know, this is the way this one particular writer writes or this one particular singer sings or I'm mocking somebody's voice. It's more particular. Um, that tries to get closer. It tries to do things like like through mimicry, um, whereas a cons metaphysical conceit or a conceit in general um, is a kind of doubling in the sense that it's a meta metaphorical, right? So, or a comparison between one thing and another. So that's a, a without using like or as as a metaphor, right? Simile uses like or as. Um, it's the same kind of comparin comparison of two things, but it uses estrangement to establish intimacy. So if I go back to Encyclopedia Britannica here, um, the metaphysical conceit is associated with the metaphysical poets of the 17th century um, that are coming in right, right after um, uh, um, Shakespeare, and particularly John Donne, is one of them. Um, uh, um, famous, famous poems by um, John Donne, um, uh, um, A Valediction Forbidding Morning. Um, you might have come across, the, across this in another English class. Um, for Helena, if we go back to the play, she says, Your virtue is my privilege. For that it is not night, when I do see your face, therefore I think I am not in the night, nor doth this wood lack worlds of company. For you, in my respect, are all the world. Then how, for you, in, in my respect, are all the world, then how can it be said that I am alone when all the world is here to look on me? Um, right? So it's this way of taking Demetrius, who's rejecting her in the lines beforehand. He says, you do impeach your modesty too much to leave the city and commit yourself into the hands of one who loves you not. Like I could take advantage of you, I could rape you. Um, to trust the opportunity of the night and the ill counsel of the, a desert place with the rich worth of your virginity. Like I could, totally, I could do whatever I want to right now is kind of what he's saying. And, um, and and that's what she's saying. Your virtue is my privilege, right? For that is not, for that it is not night when I do see your face. So if I am here, and it's the night, and you do take advantage of me because you are all the world to me, I'm not alone. And so she expands it out to the the this absurd, right? Um, uh, uh, experience of reality ex itself. And that's what we mean by a metaphysical conceit. So, uh, um, uh, and, and an early one, right? So if it becomes really kind of popular with John Donne in the um, 17th century, um, it's not that conceits were, weren't around through the Petrarchan conceit. It's just that Shakespeare's having some influence on the form here, or at least he's evidencing 
um, a shift in the style. Um, uh, Demetrius wants to leave um, Helena in the wild here, um, uh, but then Helena averts or inverts Ovid um, uh, by telling another story from f the story of Daphne and Apollo. Um, and so in Ovid, um, Apollo, the god of Apollo, is, falls in love with Daphne and starts chasing her. Um, so that's the hunt of love. But what happens in this story is there's an inversion where Helena um, makes Demetrius into the one that's hunted. Um, so uh, uh, Daphne and Ovid is a follower of Artemis also and wants to remain a virgin. Remember, that's what Hippolytus was doing, the son, the son in myth of Theseus and Hippolyta, right? Who reject becomes a follower of Artemis. Um, uh, um, but her father, so Daphne's father, Penthe uh, Peneus, sorry, uh, uh, who's a river god, wants her to marry and have children. So this is an inversion of what? It's an inversion of that relationship between father and daughter between um, Aegeus um, and Hermia, right, earlier on. in the So again, we're out in the forest and we're getting these inversions taking place. Um, and uh, um, uh, in this case, the daughter does not want to get married, does not want to have married, does, does not want to have kids um, uh, in, in the Daphne story. So fleeing from Apollo, Daphne begs her father to help. Her father relents and changes her into a laurel tree, and that's where the metamorphosis happens. So note here the father-daughter relationship that I goes back to my lecture for act uh, the general lecture of introducing the play. Do fathers get their way? Um, by the end of the play, there's an easement on the the ruling right that's happening in Act One, and so we see this very much in the middle of the play. We see these inversions happening in the forest. <clears throat> Uh, so we should think about the inversion as re on the relenting father and the context of the play in the forest. It's also inver an inversion, like I said, of the hunt of love. Um, and uh, um, another great line from the text here, I'll follow thee and make a heaven of hell. Um, uh, Oberon says, fare thee well, nymph, implicitly accepting Helena's self-comparison to Daphne. And then he acts as a kind of father figure here to try and grant her his wish or grant her her wish and then says, asks Puck to go fulfill it. And of course, Puck does it wrong or kind of wrong, um, uh, um, but it works out in the end, right? So we get another kind of mistake um, of identity that happens when... Um, when when uh, Puck or Robin um, puts the spell not on Demetrius but on Lysander, um, and uh, later on in the play, so uh, in Act Two Point Two, let's uh, sort of, uh, sort of Act Two Scene Two, um, we move on a bit here. Um, Titania begins um, here uh, in uh, iambic pentameter which is another form of verse. So remember, this is one of the most metric and especially rhymed plays that Shakespeare writes. So he's doing a lot of different kinds of scheming, uh, of rhyme schemes. So Titania 2.2, um, come now a roundel and a fairy song, then for the third part of a minute hence, some to kill cankers in the musk rose buds, um, some war with with rear, um, rearmus <laughs> for the, excuse me that that that's not a word that I use a lot. Um, bats, it's a word for bats. Some war with rearmus for their leathern wings to make my small elves coats, and some keep back the clamorous owl, the nightly hoots and wonders at our quaint spirits. Sing sing me now asleep. Um, then to your offices and let me rest. Um, and so this is uh, um, an invocation of the fairies, right? She's asking the fairies to come around and sing this song. It's also, it could be called an apostrophe, um, except that 
the fairies we assume are really right there and around her. And then the fairies come in, they're responding to her invocation and notice how this incantatory verse changes. So um, uh, Titania's verse isn't really heavily stressed, but you, when you read it and try and map it out between accent marks, you can see the iambic in there. Um, and you can see that it's uh, usually around 10 lines long. So come now a roundel and a fairy song. Then for the third part of a minute, hence. So um, you can parse it out a, a little bit. It doesn't always have to work quite exactly, but sometimes when you do the accents, so you can hear the ways that things might have been heard or stressed in Shakespeare's time as well. So let's look at the fairies here, and we see this 8787 seven incantatory verse. First fairy says, you spotted snakes with double tongue, thorny hedgehogs be not seen, newts and blind worms do not blind worms do not know wrong, come not near our fairy queen. So we see that kind of eight seven, and we can feel in the English language, you can feel that it's only at a halfway point. So let me read it again. You spotted snakes with double tongue, thorny hedgehogs be not seen. Hmm. It does end the sentence, there's a period there, or a full stop, but something more, we're expecting something more. Newts and blind worms do no wrong, come, come not near our fairy queen. And then the chorus jumps in, and they've got all of these sevens and 114 um, lines. So, um, uh, Philomel with melody, sing in our sweet lullaby, lula lula lullaby, lula lula lullaby. Never harm, nor spell, nor charm come our lovely lady nigh, so good night with lullaby. Um, and so we get this kind of swirling almost effect that you can hear, and you might want to try reading it out loud if you're reading it silently, or definitely I've got um, a couple of performances of the play listed in our modules. Um, so there have been recent um, uh, uh, film versions of a Midsummer Night's Dream, or on YouTube, you can look up various different performances um, on podcasts. If you search podcasts in Apple, um, for example, or in iTunes, um, you can come up with a lot of uh, um, people reading the text itself. Um, and they might be reading and accenting things better than I am just um, from my living room here. Um, second fairy, weaving spiders come not here, hence you long-legged spinners, hence. Beetles black approach not near, worm nor snail do no offense. So they keep saying the same thing, don't, that they're doing a protection spell. That's literally what the language does. That is magic, right? That, that, that they're doing an incantation. And the fact that Shakespeare is sort of getting away with this on stage, with these, he's invoking pagan ceremonies and rituals and literally magic on the stage. He's set up a situation where we're out in the middle of the forest and then he's able to do all of this stuff with rhyme and with meter. And um, uh, again, he's competing with <laughs> the kind of Oxford educated guys, but he's bringing in his country bumpkinness, and he's kind of saying, giving the middle finger to the to. Um, the, I, I think this is like a way of definitely reading how Shakespeare's marking the fact that he um, is is a great poet himself, and that he deserves patronage. If we go back to what Green Blatt was saying here, and it's through all of these variations of meters and form, and the fact that he's able to bring it to England. So he's not just saying like, oh, well, I can like mimic the ancient Greeks and I can mim mimic the Romans. I can bring in England. I can invoke the queen and bring in England too. And I can get, have this kind of nationalist element as well. Uh, let's see. Um, Uh, Lysander comes in. Um, oh, sorry, Oberon. Let me get to Oberon first. Oberon um, starts at um, Act Two, Scene Two, Thirty One, here, and he um, is using eight syllables to start, but then proceeds into sevens, and that keeps this kind of perpetual um, rhythm moving. So, 
it's not like people are locked into the grid of their um of of the speech patterns of the rhythmic patterns like just like there's an invocation of the fairies between titania and then the fairies we get oberon kind of doing it too but he transitions within his own sort of speech here um so what see what thou seest when thou dost wake that's right eight um do it for thy true love take love and languish for his sake be it ounce or a cat or a bear pard or boar with bristled hair in thy eye thy shall appear when thou wakest it is thy dear wake when some vile thing is near um wake when some vile thing is near the seven right wake when some vile thing is near. I'm just making sure um uh um so it's, it's good to sort of you know sometimes read with a pen and or scan things and um, I can put up a, some more stuff on poetic scansion here, um, but this is why it's important to to maybe read things out loud and to to to, to you know mean honor Shakespeare that he didn't really think in his life that this stuff was going to necessarily be printed, and so when you read it out loud, you see that he's showing his ability as a writer um, by his ability to shift back and forth in these various different ways. Um, uh, so then Lysander comes in um, with a close to something close to iambic pentameter. Um, so an iamb, right? Um, uh, da 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 da. Right. That's that the iamb. The, an iamb is a foot, a metrical foot. Da da. Right. Um, uh, unaccented followed by accented. Um, and if you put five of them in a row, you've got ten syllables. And then so the five pentameter, the five feet of the meter add up to 10 syllables. And this becomes common throughout much of Shakespeare. Um, and it's, it's common in the sonnets as well. Um, but the variations, when it doesn't quite fit, that's where we get uh, some room for interpretation. But we, but we also get like, like it, it's just boring. Like like if you listen um, to, to house music, for example, which is like four on the floor, you've got like a bass drum, like it's like a, like EDM or electronic dance music. I mean, like eventually that, that, that's supposed to sort of go away. It's there and it's very pronounced, but because it stays the same all the time, it maneuvers away out of your mind so that you can hear the other orchestrations that the EDM musician is doing. Right, so that's a different way of, of, of perhaps thinking about some of the things I'm trying to get at here. Um, uh, notice how Hermia, um, uh, well, let me go back to Lysander here. So sometimes it's 11 with when Lysander comes in um, here um, uh, uh, to, or to a contemporary ear, it sounds like it might be 11, but there might be some slippage in between the ways that we pronounce words in Shakespeare's um, uh, audiences. Um, so again, I say try reading out loud. Notice how Hermia, when she comes in, she's acting in the opposite way to Helena by suggesting that they sleep apart. So whereas um, Helena was saying, like, use me like a dog, um, uh, Hermia, who's been the one who's like in love and supposed to meet up with her lever she's invoking separation at this point in the place so the reversals are happening all over the place puck comes back in again and we see that kind of shift um from eight seven eight seven right um through the forest have i gone but athenian found i none on whose eyes i might approve this flower's force and stirring love night and silence who is there here weeds of athens he doth wear um, and so uh, he's. this is where he, of course, inverts Oberon's command and he accidentally doses, um, or maybe it's not an accident because of the way <laughs> that it's written um, and the way things work out, right? That he doses Lysander instead of Demetrius. So then we get a move back to kind of a blank verse, which is iambic, but it's not necessarily rhymed with Helena. She wakes Lysander 
and then um, Hermia wakes and cites a dream of serpents. And so we get Hermia here. This is a, yet another allusion to Ovid, to Ovid's metamorphosis. So when I said in earlier lectures that Shakespeare really loves his Ovid, I, I think I can't reach Ovid right now. I could pull, pull it down from the shelf. Um, uh, uh, this is in book four of the Metamorphoses. Um, and she's citing um, uh, Eno, um, I-N-O. Um, so here in Ovid's story, um, Tisiphon, who's one of the Furies, is sent by Hera or Juno. Remember, Juno is being sort of associated in this play with Titania um, to use serpents to madden Eno and um, Athamas. Um, Eno ultimately escapes. Juno is getting revenge um, on Cadmus's family, um, which is then associated with Thebes, um, the founder of Thebes, and Semele, who's Eno's sister who is the mother of Dionysus by Zeus or Jupiter. Um, and so uh, this is just my interpretation here. I'm not citing anyone else. Um, and we're not doing a lot of Roger's interpretations in here because I'm kind of just giving you an accented and contextualized reading. But um, just to sort of end up at, um, part two here, um, uh, this might be a stretch right now. And that's, that's the thing what I'm trying to get. It's like, we're not always right. Like when we, when we have... Um, as readers, it's like, oh, well, I remember in Ovid, and then you start trying to chase down all of these things. I don't expect any of my students to understand or or, or, or come in and be like, oh, yes, oh, well, the Ovid, he's just like Ovid is being <laughs> invoked here. No, I've done a lot of study and, and, um, and research here, and I would probably need to do more. But so this might be a bit of a stretch, but we might... Uh, maybe we could see something in Nash's book on dreams that's more solid here. Um, but if we're going with Ovid, and t then Titania is like Juno, right? A mar and she's a marriage goddess, Juno is. She's a foil to Oberon. Um, a foil is a character who poses a kind of opposition, right? Like in fencing, you have the swords are called foils, right? So an opponent uh, to Oberon. And perhaps she's doing some dream meddling in Hermia as a counter to Oberon's messing with Lysander. So we know, we see that Oberon is using these potions and he's using Robin Goodfellow, but it could also be that Titania or Juno is doing her own messing um, from the female counterpoint. And then we could read gendered stuff in here as well. So it's just a little unsettled moment. It's a thought that I had when I was reading the text. And that is where like we do research or where we kind of dig in and we parse things out and we, you know, look up the references in Ovid and try and make some sort of comparisons and make some sense of, of what's going on with Shakespeare. Um, does it just seem to be sort of thrown in or does the illusion have meaning and 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 what is the illusion doing for the different layers of Shakespeare's audience right we know well maybe not you know the average sort of working class um, peasant type of person is probably not going to be getting these illusions to Ovid um, but they might be laughing or getting at something in another way um, if there are references to magic for example um, showing up, uh, uh, um, is it, are they references to witches and witchery, um, uh, which is serious business at the time, at a time where you could be burned at the stake, right, for heresy. Um, so I'm going to end this lecture here. This ends um, Act 2 with um, all sorts of questions. Nothing settled about these readings. It's okay. I don't have the 100% story on things. Um, I, I probably made a lot of mistakes in my, my reading or some of my, my counting, um, but we do the best that we can. Um, and uh, sometimes even it's in our mistakes. Sometimes I try and chase something down that I think is an allusion to something, and it, I, it totally doesn't pan out. It's like, oh, huh. um, but it's not, it's what it's not. And what happens, I think, a lot in my early literature classes is like you get students who are like, I think, I mean, maybe I think you're maybe reading a little bit too much into the text. That's not what I'm saying. I don't think that there's 
a possibility of um, reading too much into the text. There are different reading strategies that we could bring to the text, and some work and some don't work on differing occasions. One way of reading isn't going to get you the way, um, isn't going to work all the time. And that's why we have different lenses that we bring to things. We have different literary theories. Those theories change over time. Criticism changes over time. If we're concerned right now with um, an emphasis on uh, um, uh, maybe looser sexual mores in um, a Midsummer Night's Dream, is that speaking from our twenty where we're at in the 21st century? Right. How might we read um, trans or non-binary gender possibilities into texts like this? I kind of alluded to that with fairies that they might they might not necessarily be gendered masculine or feminine, right? Um, but we have a new, um, a recent language anyway around um, uh, transgender and non-binary genders. Um, we're very attuned to. Um, distinguishing sexual orientation from gender expression, for example, right? Now, all of that kind of current situation we can bring into our readings of Shakespeare, and they will be really different than the ways that Victorians read Shakespeare. And that's part of what literary criticism does. It doesn't just treat the text as a classic that exists in a sort of transcendent zone of like of all time. And I, I will resist that in my readings, like the resistance of like uh, that. Uh, sometimes it's like like uh, there's I've got this there's a bookstore in Denver called the Tattered Cover, and they, they often have like little quotes on their um, uh, uh, um, bookmarks that they give out. Um, and one of them is like, books are humanity in print. And it's like, ah, I don't know. I kind of res resist that universal humanity language. It's very European. And we can see that the Europeans like to steal Indian children and then fight over them, right? <laughs> even the fairies, the European fairies are even capable of colonialism. So uh, uh, I want to resist that that kind of like, like uh, um, oh, Shakespeare, or oh, like this, like putting up, like, like, hopefully when you're digging into the text we see that like first of all there's so much richness to the text that's just true um uh but but we don't necessarily just like study shakespeare just because he's shakespeare right like um in the ways that that um sometimes he might get treated um in culture I've, i'm really trying to, to to show why he's a really good writer <laughs> And why, why he's he's exceptionally worth reading, um, and so layered in all sorts of ways. Uh, so I've I've um, shifted a little bit away to from the text and into interpretation. Uh, I'm gonna go ahead and end this um, uh, lecture here, and we'll pick up again um, in another lecture with Act Three. Thanks for listening or watching. Take care.